Welcome everybody. Uh, this, you're tuning in to Northeastern States Biology and Chemistry Seminar Series. This is our first talk of the semester and uh, I'm really excited. We've got just an incredible way to kick this uh, seminar series off. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Chang from the New York Times is joining us uh, from the East Coast uh, safely in, in his house there. So we're all uh, doing this remotely. Uh, I wish we could, uh, maybe maybe in the future we'll, we'll try and or Mr. Chang out from the East Coast to, to come on campus, but really appreciate his time here. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started to keep in mind. The chat is currently disabled, but that doesn't mean that you can't put in questions. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Feel free as Mr. Chang's presenting, or if you want to now, to write your questions into that box. I'm gonna be sitting off in the background kind of curating those questions, and we'll try and save some time at the end uh, for a bit of Q&A back and forth. I will be relaying the questions, but I'll do my best to, to get to them there. Uh, and then this session is being recorded and will be posted to uh, the Biology and Chemistry Series uh, website, I believe, uh, after, uh, it'll probably take about a day or so, but we'll get that, that video linked up. Um, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Kenneth Chang, the science reporter, uh, one of the science reporters for the New York Times. Uh, with a background in physics, he specializes in writing about NASA and the physical sciences. His articles have included uh, the mysteries of ghostly elemental particles known as neutrinos, the discovery of a planet with puffiness of a cork around a distant star, and how the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York demoted Pluto years before the rest of the world, which is something we are all emotionally still dealing with. Before joining the Times, Mr. Chang was a science writer for ABC News from 97 to 2000. In the summer of 97, he covered science for the Star Ledger in New York, uh, Newark, New Jersey. And from 96 to 97, he reported on education news for the Greenwich Times in Greenwich, uh, Connecticut. From 95 to 2000, Mr. Ching was a freelance writer for a number of local publications. And so something I'm curious to hear about is his uh, experience from writing at local scale to uh, the journal record for the New York Times. Interestingly, a piece of his background that, that I was unaware of was that he was involved in the early days of the World Wide Web when he worked at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications which built on innovations to create NSCA Mosaic, which was the first web browser to, to mix text and images together. So a little bit before Google's time. Uh, Mr. Chang's article, 10 Planets, Why Not 11, appeared in the Best American Science Writing 2006 book, uh, which presents a wide range of the day's leading topics in science. In 96, he received the Excellence in Journalism Award for the, the Connecticut chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. He was born in Philadelphia and. Uh, 1965, graduated cum laude with a BS in physics from Princeton and received a master's uh, in science and physics from the University of Illinois, uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. In 1988, he graduated with a certificate in writing from the University of California, Santa Cruz and a great number of other things. His latest article in the Times, which came out September 15th, is a solar forecast, uh, good news for civilization as we know it. Uh, and without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Mr. Kenneth Chang. Hi, thank you very much for like the recap of my entire life. Appreciate that. Um, so it's, it's great to be talking with you this afternoon, um, at least virtually. Um, let me s share my screen so I can start seeing my slides. Um, so I've been at the Times for 20 years now, amazingly. And of course, it's not showing the right one now. I think if you, it looked like it was trying to show it, maybe give it one more shot. Okay. Like it was, has a little bit of a lag. Ah, okay, okay. great. Um, so I've been at the Times for 20 years. 15 years before that, I was in college um, as a physics major at Princeton. And my thought was I was going to be a, a scientist, a university professor perhaps. and like a lot of people who get into physics, physics is sort of the romantic notion of, of science where you want to understand everything about the universe to try to find the most basic laws of, of the universe. And then from that, everything else, you can calculate everything else because physicists think that everything else is details. Um, and so after, after getting my undergraduate degree in physics, I went to Illinois to be um, for graduate school to get my PhD. And I started doing stuff like this. Um, this is people who do science usually deal with equations. And this is, it looks complicated like a differential equation. The idea is fairly simple. Um, it's just saying that 
in some system of dynamics, there's the actual physics that's going on that can be very complicated, and you want to apply a force to make it simple. So this f of sub e is the actual experimental system in the, in the real world. f of m is what you want, or sorry, f of m is your model of what you think is going on, and g is your ideal goal that you want to, to control the system to. So I was trying to study um, control, of, control of chaos. And this idea here was that basically you, should, you can subtract out the complicated stuff that, you're, that you don't like and then add in this goal. And so that, that was your driving force. You apply the, the system. And if, if, you're, if it worked perfectly, it would be great. So um, obviously, my, this uh, dream of becoming a physicist didn't work out. And I tend to blame science writing for that, for that fail. Um, in particular, I blame James Glick for this great book called Chaos, because um, this is a book I read when I was in graduate school. And it painted this really fantastic new field that was emerging at the time, where people were trying to understand really complex systems um, and finding really interesting patterns within this really seemingly chaotic system. Um, and it was only later that I realized that this was actually an amazing job of marketing by people in this field, because chaos sounds like it's really exciting, um, because but it was really just a rebranding of what people had known as nonlinear dynamics. And anyone who's ever dealt with nonlinear dynamics, that's just another way of saying equations you have no prayer of solving. Um, and it turned out, so even though I spent years and years trying to control chaos, I basically did not succeed. And finally, I decided um, to leave physics without my PhD and sort of embrace chaos by becoming a journalist. Um, and, this is, and this is in the um, 90s. So this is the end of the Cold War. I remember when I was at Illinois as a graduate student, um, there was this article sort of posted by the grad students' mailboxes. Um, the important uh, sentence in here was that, there was one tenure track position at Amherst College, Amherst College which is the small college in Massachusetts. 813 people applied. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I'm not, I'm pretty good, but I'm not really at the top of my 813. So maybe I should think about trying to do something else with my life. Um, so then I started realizing that I really enjoyed writing about physics much more and other science more than actually doing it. And actually sort of the turning point in where I started realizing this was I spent one summer in this program called um, the Mass Media Fellowships, which is sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And they basically take these science students, mostly graduate students, and place them at media outlets across the country for 10 weeks. I managed to spend um, 10 weeks in San Francisco writing for the San Francisco Chronicle. And I had way much more fun doing that than actually doing physics because it was really liberating to be able to, one, um, start researching an article and finishing it in a couple of days. And also, you get to talk to all these really brilliant scientists about many different topics. And, and they don't assume you know the answer already. Um, because I guess that was one of the things that I really, after a while, I sort of was scared as a graduate student because when you talk to your advisor, you kind of feel guilty asking a question because you feel like you should know the answer already. But when you're a journalist, um, people kind of assume you don't know anything. And that's great because you can ask all the questions you want and these really smart people think about it and try to give you a really clear answer. But um, trying to explain this to other people is hard. So especially to scientists, you see debates like this once in a while. Um, can science journalism be entertaining and responsible? Because there's sort of a conflict when you're trying to write the science, um, you're you, you inevitably simplifying because you can't include those equations that I, I showed earlier. And so everything's described in words which are approximate. Um, they're never a precise explanation. Um, so this page that was on, um, slash dot. The first, um, the first response was no. Um, another one is: Is good science journalism possible? And if you look at the uh, URL for this, it actually says: Is scientific journalism doomed? 
And this one was actually proposing that it should be scientists who write science articles, not journalists. Um, and of course, I obviously disagree. And I guess the main thing difference is I am not writing for scientists. I'm trying to explain science to people who are curious, but they don't have the background. They haven't spent years studying it. Um, and yet, you don't have to be an expert in something to appreciate a lot of the wonder and amazing things that happen in science. And so when a NASA spacecraft goes past Pluto or you, they discover a new form of life, you don't need to be a biologist to appreciate that. And as, as I was sort of hinting at before, being a science journalist is a great job for people who can't um, concentrate long enough to write a thesis or really, so to be a really great scientist, you really need to be able to think long and deep about certain er certain ideas and, and really get to the bottom of it. And I realized finally when I was a graduate student, I was better sort of um, doing something quickly um, and writing about it, which in a way was like a test to see whether I really understood the big picture of what the science was about, but then I get to move on something else, which I love. Um, on the other hand, because I've done this so long, I've sort of been able to follow some topics for a long time. And it's kind of amazing how much of my um, of career has been tied up with Pluto. Um, so for anyone who's a student right now, you've never, you don't remember a time when Pluto was not a planet. Um, so when I started, at the New York Times, Pluto was a planet. And this was one of the very first articles I wrote a few months after I started. Um, and this was when the American Museum of Natural History, when they redid their big exhibit there, their astronomy exhibit, they quietly left out Pluto. And in fact, no one really noticed for an entire year until one of the science reporters, editors, caught up the science editor at the New York Times and said, Pluto is missing. And, and then the science editor said, go look, go check this out. And they were kind of surprised that we were writing about it then when it had been missing for a year already. Anyway, so this was one of the first articles I got on page one, and it, it got a lot of attention. It sort of made Neil deGrasse Tyson even more famous than he was because he suddenly became the villain who wanted to demote Pluto. Um, and then finally, um, five years ago, NASA spacecraft New Horizons finally made it to Pluto. So this is 14 years after I wrote that other article. We finally got our first close-up images of Pluto, which and this was on the page one of the New York Times. And it it felt wonderful to be able to follow this knowledge of Pluto from basically almost nothing to these wonderful close-up pictures where we can now see ice volcanoes, um, frozen plains, and really complex and there seems to be even underground seas of super cold ices on Pluto. So it's, it's much more complicated than anyone ever would have thought for something that was so far away and so small. And oh, some definitions. So I'm a science reporter. So that means I generally don't write about health, which I describe as health is something that can kill you. I don't write about, about the iPhone or, or Google. So, so technology I say is something that can kill someone else. And science, which is what I mostly write about, is everything else that has no practical purpose. Um, which doesn't mean it's, it's not of any use, because um, that's sort of the things that really catches people's attentions and really you think about bigger questions. And so does anyone care? Because a lot of times people say, like, well, does any, what does it mean? Doesn't have any application to your everyday life. And I really disagree with that. So. Here's a, uh, the front page of the New York Times from a couple of days, from, yeah, from last week. So most of the headlines over here are pretty depressing. There was the huge fires on the West Coast. Um, there's a conflict in Japan, um, more um, uh, political um, debates and such. On the bottom of that page, there was a story about Venus and the possibility that there was life in the clouds of Venus, which was a surprise because people generally don't think of Venus in clouds because Venus, even though it's um, about the same size of Earth, it probably had an environment similar to Earth earlier in the history of the planet, 
But today, um, it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. It has clouds that include sulfuric acid. So it didn't seem like a place that life could possibly exist. Um, but uh, these researchers actually were looking at it anyway. And they found this chemical called phosphine in the atmosphere of, of Venus. And what was really interesting is because they had looked at phosphine, which is this very simple molecule. It's one, one atom of phosphorus and three atoms of hydrogen. But it's really hard to make that because it like, takes a lot of heat and pressure to push those atoms together into phosphine. Um, so you can do that on Saturn and Jupiter, and we know there's not life there, at least nothing that we, we would expect there to be. But you know, uh, Jupiter and Saturn have, are really super hot and super high pressure, so it made sense that you could find phosphine here. But on Venus and smaller planets like that, the only way this, this, the scientists working on this could come up with a way to plausibly make phosphine was that there were microbes in the atmosphere of Venus, like tens of miles up in the atmosphere, that uh, were of the type that don't use oxygen. And then they would produce phosphine um, as, as part of their biological processes. And we do know that this, this occurs on Earth. Um, in sewage and, and marsh gas and places like that. So it seemed intriguing. It's not proof that there's life on Venus, but it went, made a lot of people go, hmm. And 1.9 million people clicked on this article, at least on the web. And so clearly there was an interest in this topic among everyone. So, but of course, when you write, when I'm writing about physics, this is sort of how I try to approach it. So that I cannot explain every detail of phosphine or every chemical pathway that you could possibly have to create phosphine. Um, so I try to think of, I'm trying to convey three ideas um, in a story. So, so for this Venus article, there would be that one that there may be life on Venus. Two, that there's this chemical called phosphine and um, it can, at least on Earth, we don't know how it's produced anyway, except for biological processes. And three, that otherwise Venus looks like a very inhospitable place. Um, and even this might be optimistic. So um, maybe it's just one big idea that I can convey in an article. And so if I can, if someone remembers that after reading the story or seeing it on, on the front page of the New York Times, that maybe there's life on Venus, that's something that, that's perhaps enough that it conveys something new about the universe that people now know. Um, and this is another idea I always try to say when I'm writing about science. Um, when you're a scientist, the details matter. So that when a chemist does an experiment to produce um, a certain um, reagent or a certain chemical, the error, they want to know what the, um, the yield is, what the error bars and the measurements are, and so on. Um, and that's important if you're reading a scientific paper and need to know the details because you want to know whether this applies to a certain situation or whether you can read or whether you can reproduce that result. But when writing for the public, all those details sort of um, complicate and obfuscate, obfuscate the bigger points I'm trying to convey. So getting all to in the details about phosphine makes it harder to or makes it harder for, to convey the important issues about what the actual result was. So when I put in a detail into a story, I try to ask myself, does this help build toward the one or three points I'm tr truly trying to convey? Um, sometimes I want to put it in anyway because it's a really interesting tidbit that I want to throw in there because it, makes, it ends up being entertaining. But if it's a detail that isn't important for understanding the meaning of the story, then I try to leave it out. Um, and sort of a corollary to that is don't use jargon. So I really shouldn't have said inversely proportional because that's a very um, scientific type term. Um, so it's also, also important to try to describe things in everyday language and avoid the language of scientists where possible, of course. Um, and in fact, that's where my science background is both helpful and a problem sometimes because it's helpful because a lot of times if the scientist is talking scientific jargon, I can often find, follow it. 
On the other hand, um, it gets harder to use the information because they're explaining it at too high a level. And so it's, there's not a quote I can use. And even more dangerously, that sometimes makes it that I think I understand what they're saying when I don't really don't. So sometimes the scientists will ask me, do I have a science background? And I will say, um, yes, but I assume I'm really stupid. And that's it's actually important to for them to try to think things back to the basic level so that I can explain it at a basic level to everyone else. Oh, here's a question that I like to ask people. What's a transistor? Um, and I'll just let, so everyone sort of knows there's tons of transistors. There's billions of transistors in the chip that runs your iPhone or your computer. But um, it's, no one, it's very few people, unless they are physicists, actually know what a transistor is. I'll let you think about that as I, and we can come back to that later. And then, um, so science actually does have a big societal issues. So global warming, um, regardless of the politics of it, the basic science is actually fairly simple. Um, the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been steadily increasing over the last half century. This is um, measurements made by Charles Keeling at Mauna Loa Observatory. Um, we see he did the initial ones over that and shows from 1960, it was un, under 320 and now it's over 400. So that's, those are direct measurements. There's really no uncertainty in that. And we also know just from basic laboratory experiments that carbon dioxide does absorb light and heat and it does trap heat. So that's a basic property of the molecule. Um, there's nothing, there's no debate over that really scientifically. And there's actually sort of this, um, back to, this is Venus again. Venus is basically the existence proof that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Um, even though Venus is closer to the sun than Earth is, it wouldn't be 900 degrees Fahrenheit if it wasn't for the fact that its atmosphere is 97% carbon dioxide. And it's a really dense carbon dioxide atmosphere. So its atmospheric pressure at the surface is 1300 pounds per square inch. That compares to Earth, which is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Um, so if we ever dropped you on, on <laughs> Venus, and if you weren't dissolved by the carbon dioxide, um, by the sulfuric acid, you would be squashed by a bug on the surface of Venus. But um, so what I try to convey is in science writing, sort of why is this interesting and why, what's sort of the wonder of it. Um, and a lot of it comes from my science, my science background. So why is the sky blue? Is there anything before the Big Bang? Um, and this was actually an article I wrote about some years ago, um, which was actually an outgrowth of a problem I did um, when I was an undergrad at Princeton doing a problem set about um, pressure. And there's a basic property, which is true, that if you um, apply pressure on ice, it will lower the melting temperature. And that's sort of like one of the popular explanations for why you can ice skate, that the pressure of you standing on a skate and sliding on it would provi um, provide enough pressure on the ice to lower the melting point so that it would provide a, a little layer of liquid water and you're actually sliding on the water. Um, because ice actually is not slippery, or not very slippery. So this, it's one of those things that is actually one of the pitfalls or dangers of science writing, which is something that sounds um, reasonable and is completely not true. Um, because I, I remember that when I was doing the problem set that the numbers just didn't work. Um, if you just come up with reasonable numbers for what the pressure would be, it would just lower the temperature by a fraction of a degree. And of course you can skate on temperatures much lower lower than 32 degrees. If it's 10 degrees, you can still ice skate and you can go skiing and it's still slippery. So this wasn't the explanation. So years later, I sort of wanted to actually find out what the answer was. So I actually just read this, did this article that was on the cover of Science Times exploring that. And it turned out there's, there's actually still interesting research going on about this topic. 
Um, so one of the main things is that it's actually sort of, of the more obvious explanation, it's friction. So it's the rubbing the blade of the ice skate against the ice warms the ice and melts a small layer of, of water and you've, you're sliding across that. In addition, um, scientists more recently discovered that the very top layer of ice, because there's not another layer of, of water on top of that, those molecules can vibrate more quickly. So those, that one top layer actually does have a bit of intrinsic slipperiness. And so that actually adds to slipperiness as well. Um, another topic that I found interesting because I actually went to talk about it, um, why is glass solid? Um, and amazingly, there's still no agreed answer because if you look at the molecular structure of glass, it's it's indistinguishable from a liquid. So the molecules are seem to be randomly um, arranged, and yet, and if you, of course, if you have molten glass, it is a liquid. But at some point, um, as you cool the glass, the molecules are still random. They haven't lined up into a crystal or anything like that, but they solidify. And it was interesting that um, I could talk to people in this field. Um, and amazingly, a lot of them really didn't like each other, and they would get into these really angry arguments with each other. And it's still an open question of debate. And this is another, so one of the great things that I was saying about science writing is that it's great for people with a short attention span. So I went from why ice is slippery to glass. And here I got to write a story about Stonehenge. Um, of course, everyone's familiar with these rocks huge stones that are in England, but trying to figure out the history of the people who built this is um, still an open question because the people who were living in Britain at that point did not have a written language, so they didn't write anything down. So everything we know about them and why they built these monuments, so it has to be inferred by other clues, such as um, where the stones look like they came from, um, from a nearby site, and they could see the arrowheads and the bones and what they ate. And there's residues and cooking pots. And so a few years ago, there was a, a series of research reports that sort of were adding more details about the people who lived in Britain thousands of years ago. And so um, one of those actually suggested this. And so I got to actually go to um, Stonehenge um, hang out with some researchers who were working at a site nearby and sort of put out, put together this bigger question about what was uh, what was life like back in England back then. And that's that was a really fun thing to do. And then uh, other chemistry things. So um, I don't know if anyone's tried it, but if you chew winter green lifesavers or if you is, go to go into a dark closet, um, take a hammer and smash it, you should see um, green sparks of light. And this is actually, you're breaking sugar bonds and that actually emits the light. And it works particularly well with wintergreen because the mint in that candy sort of absorbs ultraviolet light that's emitted and then re-emits it in this green color. And this was a fun thing because I love this because I got to mention Sir Francis Bacon because he was one of the first people to notice it. I also got to qu quote Father Giambattista Bacarta, and who said, you may, when in the dark, frighten simple people only by chewing lumps of sugar, and in the meantime, keeping your mouth open, which will appear to them as if full of fire. And, you know, I couldn't do that as a scientist to like mix um, wintergreen lifesavers, this phenomenon called triboluminescence. So there was actually research being put reported by scientists at University of Illinois that, that led to this article, and then sort of pulled in ancient literature as well. Oh, and um, so this was the cover of Science Times um, when it was at the 25th anniversary of, that, of the science section. And this was back in 2003. Um, and this had, so we basically came up with 25 big questions about science um, and that seemed like it was gonna be really hard to answer. And this is, I was just sort of indicate, I think I'll still have a job for a while. So um, does science matter? 
And if you just look at these, you know, is war a biological destiny? Will humans visit Mars? And so on and so forth. Um, what should we eat? When will the next ice age begin? All these questions are still unanswered. I got to write about, can robots become conscious? And of course, we don't know what consciousness is, much less figure out how to program that into a robot. Why do we sleep? Still unknown. Um, can science prove the existence of God? Is evolution truly random? How did life begin? All these are 25 questions. Um, where, are the, where are the aliens? Um, so maybe they're in Venus, but we haven't found any yet. Um, I think I went through my slides faster than I meant to. Oh, so back to chaos and um, James Glick. So finally last year, I, I never actually met James Glick, so I finally tweeted at him. I, said, I blamed him for destroying my physics career. Um, and he responded, sorry, but not sorry, to be honest. And I totally, I, I just wanted to let you know I've been carrying this vendetta for decades. Um, but then he said I was a great science writer, so I said, thanks. Um, this is my um, card. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me, any questions about how I got into science writing or any questions about any of my articles, feel free to give me a call, send me an email. My email is kchang, K-C-H-A-N-G, at nytimes.com. I'll wrap up there for now. James, I, I really uh, appreciate the cross-section of all the things that you've written about. I've, uh, I noticed several of those articles were, were quite familiar along the way. Um, it looks like we've got a, a good amount of time for question and answer if you, if you have the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to remind the audience, uh, I've got my eye on the Q&A box, and then I have some questions as well that uh, I'll be following up on here. Um, one that I, I got several uh, from students that I really enjoyed, and one of, one of the first since we touched on phosphine on Venus, is that, um, given the, that given that there's phosphine on Venus and that phosphine is a key component of penguin poop, does that mean uh, space penguins? Yeah, um, just like there's methane on Mars, so that must be there's um, underground cows. Yeah, perfect. I feel like, so the, your recent piece about Venus was really great, but we really missed out on an opportunity for space penguins there. So maybe for the next- uh, Yeah, I'll do that in the follow-up. I'm gonna do some more investigation on that. <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, on a more serious note, uh, that same student uh, had worked previously in a marketing department as a copywriter, and they were told to never write above a fourth grade reading level. Um, while they didn't cover overly complex topics, they did write about things like vaccination and blood donation. Uh, do you think that writing at a child's level uh, for such complicated material is a disservice to the science or is speaking maybe higher uh, come off across as like condescending and elitist? So how do, you, how do you bridge the gap between not speaking below someone but not speaking over them and making them feel like they don't have a voice? Yeah, so I feel that, um, I guess I, I, I feel like I can use a somewhat higher, I guess I, I would aim for eighth grade or ninth grade, somewhere around that level. Um, I don't want to feel like you need to have a college education to understand one miracles because it, it shouldn't be that you had taken biology to understand something about biology. Um, so, and then it's not like I can't introduce more complicated concepts. So obviously phosphine is not an eighth grade word doesn't mean I can't use it, but I need to define what it is, describe what it is, and explain it in context. Um, so, so it isn't that you had to, to lo only use words that a fourth grader or eighth grader understand, but you have to not assume that they have all the knowledge to, that they've already have all the baseline knowledge and that you've, and it's, and it's not talking down to them because not everyone knows everything about everything, right? Um, just like there's a lot of jargon in baseball. So that if you're writing for a more general article, um, even you know, a home run may not be an obvious thing or much less you no know, stealing home. So it's trying to talk about ways that it's entertaining, but not in a way that is trying to leave people out because they don't have the um, sort of like the inside um, terminology that they need the special membership card to, to, to be let in to, into these secrets. Great, I, I appreciate that. We, I think, 
uh, as a faculty member, I think about that a lot when I'm writing for grants. Um, you know, it's how, at what level do you write? I mean, you want to convey that you're an expert on the material, but if no one understands what you're talking about, then you've really missed an opportunity there. And I, uh, yeah. When I read your pieces, I, I, I don't feel like I'm being spoken down to, uh, even on things that I have a more you know, complex understanding of. You seem to be at that level. So it's, it's impressive to me that you're thinking of an eighth grade, ninth grade level because uh, I certainly don't feel like I'm being spoken to like an eighth grader, ninth grader. That's a yeah. neat magic trick for people there. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, sort of writing the article is sort of like taking a test. If I really understand it, then I should be able to explain it in a way to someone else who's not an expert. If I don't understand it, then it becomes extremely hard. It's sort of like that paper where you really haven't done enough research and you're just trying to make it up as you go along. Right, right. Um, there's a number of questions that maybe I can condense down. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier on, and I really like how you put this, that you know, health is something that can kill you, technology is something that can kill other people, science is everything else. In today's climate, it seems like science is getting mixed with politics as well. And so you're almost inherently forced into this other arena. How do you approach uh, science writing in the age of misinformation and in an increasingly political landscape? Um, about things that, so I know vaccinations are not really your sphere, but um, it's not long before it starts to creep into to all science policies. Do you, do you, how, do you, how do you walk that line? Um, so fortunately, most of those things I've read about aren't politics, political. I have written some stories about climate change and I try to approach it the same way so that, as I was saying, the basic science is, it's very basic. Um, so the fact that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and the temperatures have been rising is pretty much not in anyone's um, um, controversy unless you really want to be picking at it. I mean, one of the things that always strikes me is that I believe now anyone under 30 years old has never lived during a month where the global temperature has been below average. And that's that just strikes me as something that that's meaningful and that's, and so there's a lot of things in the details that are still um, unknown. So how big an ocean, how big a role do the oceans play? The clouds, can volcanoes offset some of this? And a lot of it are real things that are still uncertainties, but the overall picture um, is quite clear. And that's sort of what I try to focus on. So try to explain clearly the parts that are clear and then try to explain the parts that are still um, being studied and where there is still uncertainty and, and try and put it in the right context. I mean, one of the things that I try to make sure I don't do, so with climate change, um, just because we don't know everything does not mean we know nothing. And that's, so it's, it's clear to say that we know that the temperature rising, we know that carbon dioxide is a warming gas and, and it's important to sort of make sure that that does not get undercut in what I'm writing. And then write about the, the newer science and try and explain that as well. And so do you, I guess along those same lines, the, the principle of climate change seems to be more universally accepted, but the battle uh, or the argument now has seemed to, to go into what is the, the principal driver of it. So if you were writing an article about global warming, are you saying that you would focus more on the fact that global warming is occurring and not that it is yeah, um, I mean, or? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would say outright that um, the, the main driver of global warming is um, anthropogenic release of carbon dioxide. I, scientifically, I don't think there's any other plausible explanation. And, and there's, I mean, even 10 years ago, that wasn't really a question among scientists. And so while there's huge policy questions, um, the science has really been settled for quite a while. And then along the same lines, um, I noticed so just, just on your article about life on Venus, uh, which I thought was fantastic. I was reading through the comments um, and there's people who are just very aggressive about comments about possible life on Venus and then take it you know, into kind of, again, political sort of directions there. So um, several questions have been asked about how do you handle uh, bad reactions to your writing? And uh, do you, is it something that you, you know, take personally or is it something you, you've kind of developed an ability to be like, ah, eh, well, that's just how people are. 
Um, I, fortunately, the Times actually moderates the comments unlike a lot of other places on the internet. So generally, the, the questions are pretty thoughtful, or um, the comments. So I don't get upset usually. I, in fact, I, for certain articles, I've actually responded to, to people in the comments. And you, you can actually get, get some pretty interesting conversations going back and forth at times. Um, I, if people start attacking me because of the perceived overall um, position of the New York Times, I, I can ignore that because that has nothing to do with me. Um, I don't take it personally. And generally, I don't get very many emails or, or Twitter comments directed directly at me, um, possibly because I'm writing about these esoteric things as opposed to the hot button issues. Right. Um, what is the, what's the hardest story that you've written about? Is it about these more politically sensitive things? Or? No, actually, so it's as, as I was saying before, it's one that's where I sort of gotten something that's more confused than, um, than clear. So I remember there's a story about this um, chemical, I don't remember the details, but something called pegylation. So it's for drugs and you try to put these um, molecules on the outside of it so that it could get into the body, I believe, more easily. Um, and I realized there was, I didn't do enough research about it or, or, and I didn't have everything clear enough in my mind. So that was extremely painful to write um, because I was trying to make something that was complex. It probably wasn't as important as I was, thought it was originally. And it was, it was, it was hard not making it excruciatingly boring. I mean, I guess, I guess that's the, always what you hope you don't, that someone would finish reading or, or stop reading one of my stories and went, that was just a complete waste of time. I learned nothing and it was boring. Well, if you, you said earlier, you can't stay inversely proportional. So I think probably polyethylene glycol for pegylation would be uh, a, bit, <laughs> yeah. a bit much for- Yeah, for no, that's, you're giving me flashbacks here. <laughs> Uh, well, we should we should get together and talk about pegylation. We do a lot of <laughs> coding in my lab, uh, of which I won't bore people with here. Um, along those lines, the student was just asking, um, how long is the process of writing an article? So I, I assume it depends on the topic, but what does it look like for you from concept to draft and editing? You know, what's, what's that timeline look like? It depends on very much on what the story is. Um, some of them have been sort of simmering for years before I get to them. Other ones, you know, something happens on the space station or something else. And basically I had to write something up immediately and it's, and it's online and published um, within hours, I guess. So, so one of these things that you can, that's a rush, but you can almost plan for it is the Nobel prizes every year. So you know exactly when they're going to be announced. You I wake up early that day to watch chemistry and, um, and, but I have no idea who's going to win or what it's going to be. Unlike physics, where you can sometimes guess like it's going to be the Higgs boson. I am, I swear I'm surprised every year by the, the chemistry Nobel. And, you know, hmm? Especially yes. last year, it's been very uh, hard to predict. Fortunately, someone else got to do it last year for me. Um, <laughs> but, um, and it's, it's kind of, it's, you actually sort of get an adrenaline rush because you go from this citation of you know, 10 words that you have no idea what it means. And then a few hours later, and certainly by the end of the day, you've written this long article that's gonna be in print in the New York Times and people think like I'm knowledgeable about this topic. <laughs> the, I think the phrase that we used to use, and, and actually I didn't realize you were part of the mass media study. I was a AAAS fellow uh, myself for science and technology. Um, hmm. But the, the phrase that, that went around there was fake it till you make it uh, for, you know, when you're <laughs> speaking to audiences. Um, so that's the shorter end, you know, uh, Nobel laureates announced you need an article out in a few hours. What's the, for the, what's the longer end for you? There's probably like things I've, I've been meaning to write about that I still haven't like years, late, decades later. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I want to write a story about diamonds. Um, and how they the whole range of diamonds between what's been found recent more recent to more recent mines in Canada versus where they are making artificial ones and and the whole process there, there seems to be a really interesting story in there I haven't figured out how to tie it all together yet so I guess we're close to 20 years on that already <laughs> without having produced it um, but I guess I'm not working on that continuously obviously 
So on the longer ones, perhaps a few months, and again, not continuously, but it's sort of weaved in and out from other things. So do your, I guess, do your editors kind of come to you every now and then say, Kenneth, what do you have for us? And you bring up articles you've been writing on? or Yeah, so sometimes they have things that they, they want to do. So, um, so the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, that was an obvious thing to be writing about. So we started planning that months in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started figuring out where, how to write something that has been written, you know, ten thousand times, um, and and then it was kind of fun because I managed to talk to Michael Collins, who was the command pilot. So he was the one circling the moon for a couple of days while Neil and Buzz got to get all the glory walking on the surface of the moon. And he's extremely eloquent. He he wrote probably the best um, book about that called Carrying the Fire. But you know. So he wasn't an unknown, but he didn't get as much attention as the others. And then I happened to come across this place um, in the suburb of LA where there used to be a huge aerospace factory where North American had built the Apollo spacecraft and now it's a mall. And and so it was, it was great to sort of delve into that history and, and, and write about where you would be hard pressed to find anything about it now. Do you do a lot of uh, traveling for these articles? So did you go to the, the, the mall? And... Yeah, so that one I did go out there and talk to people there. Um, and I spent the longest time trying to get a face-to-face -face interview with Michael Collins and failed. <laughs> so I ended up talking to him by phone. Um, but it, it all worked out well. Well, if the New York Times can't get a face-to-face -face with Michael Collins, then uh, it's... <laughs> nobody, nobody can. Um, somebody brought up, and this is a good question, we, we never looped back around to transistors. Where, where are we going with that? Oh, so transistors. So, so again, you sort of know that there's, you know, they're crucial for how your computer works. And, and you know, and you read an article about what Intel is coming out, they say this one has, you know, or when Apple is going to make its announcement about the iPhone next month, they'll say this one has you no... Know, this many transistors and it's this many times faster than the previous one. And you still don't know what a transistor is. Um, but um, so I know, so I'm not going to be able to explain the solid state physics of how transistors work, but I can say something like it's basically a voltage controlled switch. Um, so if you apply a voltage across the transistor, um, that will stop the, or that will, I always forget which one it is, that will allow current to go through or stop it. And the other one, and that's basically the one and zero of how computers talk. And so it doesn't give you um, a degree in electrical engineering, but at least it sort of takes a little bit of the veil off this magic of science that, and technology where it's a big black box and that you have some sense of what's going on inside your computer. That reminds me of uh, the actor Alan Alda has a Science Communication Institute. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, that's in Stony Brook University. And launched the Flame Challenge where uh, yes. scientists or just anybody is, is challenged to explain something that's very common but in words that, that everyone can understand. And it started out with, uh, I think the first, the first challenge was explain what a flame is. And uh, the winning uh, group put up a, like a video talking about, it was a musical, I think, talking about how the flame Yeah, it was like an opera. Yeah, that's right. So do you, I, I guess that's, that's on the back of your mind when you're, when you're writing yeah. circles, or, you know, how do you, how do you describe a flame without using science jargon? Yeah, so you're trying to convey the concept as opposed to the fact that it's combustion um, and, or oxidation, right? Um, which, you know, doesn't, it, in a sense, completely answers the question and conveys nothing. So, and it is kind of hard to explain what a flame is because you, you, everyone knows what it looks like and they know what's happening when something burns, but trying to explain the actual reactions that are going on is, is very hard. Yeah, I, I recommend to uh, everybody watching this, uh, go check out the flame challenge. It's, uh, I, I did not understand uh, a flame as well after watching the winning video. Um, what, you, you have a very diverse background here. Obviously, you've been, been a journalist for a great number of years, um, but then you have a, a very extensive science background as well. What experiences or classes have best prepared you, do you think, looking back on it now, for being a, uh, a science writer? 
Is it more science or is it more journalism or do you really feel like both come together? Um, so I, I don't think you need a journalism background to be a writer or journalist. Um, there's a lot of skills in, in figuring out how to write something, um, and especially like if you're on a short deadline, there's sort of a formula for writing a quick news story. And if you need to, you can fall back on that. But that's stuff you can pick up. It's kind of like writing grants. You don't really need, need to have a degree in grant writing to be a scientist. But it's, Although we probably should. <laughs> well, you need to learn the skills, right? But And so it's important to practice, figure out what's a good proposal and so on. Um, and I certainly did not need seven years of graduate school to become a science reporter. Um, and so I don't think a science background is essential. What is important is sort of the understanding of how science is done. So that when I, because there's very few instances where I have expertise in the particular topic I'm writing about. I mean, I was doing control of chaos. The chances of me actually writing a story about that are very, very low. Um, but what's important is that I sort of get a sense, okay, how many times have you done this experiment? What are the error bars? Uh, again, this is sort of part that doesn't get into the story itself, but I need to t ask these questions to get a sense of, is this just a very preliminary result that is just as likely to be false as true, and I shouldn't write about it at this point? or this has been checked out really well, and this is a really solid story that deserves to be um, in the New York Times right now. I, uh, one of the comments, or one of the questions just caught my eye about um, one of our students, actually we have several students with, with uh, journalism backgrounds, and one of our students was in journalism for uh, over a decade, and is now come back to pursue a degree in science, um, and I think it's kind of the, maybe the reverse of your story where mm -hmm. you were starting out on the very you know, specific depth path and decided that you, know, you really had a great number of interests uh, and the student's gonna go in the opposite way of doing a lot of larger stories and decided they want to be more in depth. Do you feel like uh, both roads lead equally? That, that, uh, do, you, do you have mm -hmm. many science writers that you know or have colleagues that you've made over the years that have decided, you know what, writing about all these topics is not enough for me. I need to know uh, the depth of them. And so they start to go the opposite way, journalist to science. I honestly don't know of any who have gone from journalism into science. I know a lot of people who have gone in from science into journalism. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's, it's hard to make the commitment to graduate school out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the path, I think yeah, probably most of the, the professional journalists at that point so went back the other way is, is uh, more challenging. Um, one of the last things that, and again, has popped up a few times within the different questions is um, the current state of print media and the future outlook. Um, you know, papers, uh, especially local papers around the country, have really been struggling. And I know that you had a background um, before you were at the Times in some smaller journals, smaller papers, although they were still quite large publications. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of print media? Um, today and and tomorrow and, and kind of the outlook. Yes, that's a, um, so there's a couple of things. One is that there actually is still quite a market for people wanting to get news, um, and especially if, and the Times is in relatively good shape compared to most places, um, because we now have like five million subscribers, which is more mil more people paying to read the New York Times than has ever been in the, in the 150 year history of the newspaper. Um, there's no particular specialness about paper. Um, so one of the ironies was I got hired at the New York Times in 2000 from abcnews.com, which is at that point like a one of the top three websites in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of odd because when I first got there, um, people were amazed that the Times had hired someone from a digital website because it, it was seen like everything was just blogs and, and not trustworthy. And it always struck me as weird because I was doing the same job. I was calling up scientists, asking questions and writing an article. And it didn't make any difference whether the words appeared on a piece of paper versus a computer screen. There were no iPhones yet. Um, so the job hasn't changed immensely. I mean, there's actually 
more interesting things you can do digitally than you can do on paper. So, but there is, there has been a collapse of the business model for journalism. So all the ads, all the, all the classifieds that used to um, pay for the local newspapers have all gone to Craigslist, but the bigger ads have gone to Facebook and Google and they're not coming back. So, and, and for a paper like the New York Times, we were able to basically appeal to our readers and say, we need you to subscribe to us because that's how you're going to pay for people like me to produce the things you want to read. And if you don't, it's going to go, if, if all news was basically had to be free, then um, there's no way the New York Times would exist. If everything was equivalent to New York Times, we would, we would not be able to be a viable business. It's, um, and I, I think perhaps local papers can carve out a niche because at least they have an advertising market that's local. Um, at least I used to feel this way. That isn't necessarily gets used, usurped by Google, um, but it's hard. And then, the, and then there's in between like the metropolitan papers where it's really hard for them to find some way because they're not big enough to really charge a lot for the news. I mean, we, we charge a couple hundred dollars for a full year. How, if you're the paper in Tulsa, can you charge $50, $20? I don't know, a year. And then that's, that's really hard to support a newsroom. Right. Yeah, we've, uh, the, the Tulsa world has done a good job of staying afloat, but it's certainly a different publication uh, than it was 10 years ago, as, as many local papers, local papers are. Um, on the topic of local papers, uh, just to squish them into one question, um, what do you read or listen to besides the New York Times uh, for your inspiration and for your news, science or otherwise? And do you have any articles, science news websites or podcasts that you recommend outside, of course, of Science Times that everyone should be uh, subscribed to? Yeah, I don't read as much as I feel like I should. Um, I do glance a lot at, at the other public so I, I check on Google News I, I check on what my Twitter feed to see what other people have re written I really do like some of the articles I've written in the Atlantic they have some excellent reporters Ed Young um, is excellent writing about health and COVID um, Marina Corin does a great job writing these longer thought pieces about NASA that, that I, want, I often think like I wish I had written that um, if you like a more scientific bent, so if, if you want to see some equations in your popular science articles, you should look at Quanta, which is published by, um, oh, sure, I've just blanked on the name, this foundation in New York. Um, it's kind of fills the niche that Scientific American used to fill, which is, um, so it's geared to people, not for an expert in the field, but someone who is comfortable with some of the mathematical language of science. Or is, willing, or is willing to just to look over it if you, because so they get to, to go in more depth than I can um, and, still, and still present it in a way that's not geared for the expert. Great. Yeah, I've not heard of Quanta. Uh, Scientific America is still publishing, right? Uh, you know, I know you yes, but it's changed. So it used to be all articles written by scientists and then rewritten by the editors. Mm -hmm. um, now it's a mix of that plus other journalist written article. So it's, it's Scientific American used to have this pseudo journal like quality um, and it's much more of a mainstream science publication, I feel. And then uh, outside of science writing, are you, are you a news junkie or do you, what do you on a daily basis, what, what, what do you like to take in outside of things that are obviously for work? Um, I like cooking. So that's actually chemistry. So <laughs> yeah. you can actually find a number of cooking articles I've written that like this, the science of baking. I did not. Uh, so, in, in the Times, you were cooking art? Yeah. So there's, there, so there's Shirley Corher, who is a chemist who became a food scientist, who's a wonderful folksy woman who lives in Atlanta, and um, so she spent decades sort of helping people figure out why their recipes went wrong, mm -hmm. um, and and she has, this, she has a book called or two books, Cookwise and Bakewise, to explain the science for, between various things, and. There's a, this amazing recipe called the Tunnel of Fudge. It was originally the winner of, of one of the Pillsbury Awards that relied on this, this fudge packet that 
got discontinued and so she recreated it. And the whole point of this recipe is that there is so much sugar in it that the proteins of flour, so it's gliden and gluten. Glut so the two molecules that form gluten, mm -hmm. basically there's so much sugar that they can't form it. So you end up with this fudgy middle. Mm. And if you look at the rest, I've, it's, it's literally like a cup of sugar, a cup of brown sugar, and then another cup of uh, powdered sugar, plus like six eggs. It's great. <laughs> well, I will have to, have to try it. And <laughs> your cooking articles, I, was an, I, I swear I had turned over every rock for your articles, but I didn't check the cooking section. So, uh, Those are actually, I got, rest, I got several recipes into Science Times. And that's one of my great achievements. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, I, I, I so appreciate your time uh, and to, to speak with us and to answer all our questions. Um, I will leave it to the students if you want to follow up uh, with individual emails. Maybe we'll keep in mind that uh, I'm sure Mr. Chang has uh, many, many yeah. things going on, but uh, I, I really appreciate um, all the great writing and the, and the excellent presentation. I hope, I hope everything stays uh, as sane and calm as possible for the rest of COVID here for you. And thank you very thank much. You very much. So uh, I guess that'll do it for us. Um, okay, hope that went okay. That I didn't talk quite as long as I was planning. Oh no, it's fine. I, it was great. We we had a lot of uh, question and answers pop up here. I think hopefully I got to a lot of them. So uh, for everyone, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. But uh, I think we got a good rounding out here. So this would be the point. I would say everyone help me thank Kenneth Chang for his presentation. But I'll just uh, do it myself. So <laughs> we really appreciate it. And um, take care, sir. Thank you.